Peter, welcome to the University of Melbourne. You've recently joined the university as a professor of experimental finance and decision neuroscience in the Department of Finance here at the university, and you also hold an honorary position at the Florey Institute for Neuroscience and Mental Health. What brings you to Melbourne? Well, a unique opportunity to realize a, a dream, uh, and that is to uh, study decision making under uncertainty, uh, human decision making under uncertainty, all the way from the brains to markets, uh, everything that's involved, to build an interdisciplinary group where we have economists, neuroscientists, engineers, computer scientists uh, working uh, uh, together. To give a little bit of background, I mean, this is an, uh, an initiative that's actually very hard to implement, even in the best of universities, uh, because we try to go across disciplines. And certainly when you come out of a discipline like economics or finance, uh, that is actually not even used to teamwork, uh, where a lot of work is still done in very, very small teams of two or three people, uh, mostly professors working with each other, uh, involving PhD students. Um, so it's a, it's a unique uh, initiative um, that I want to accomplish here, and Melbourne has given me the opportunity to do so. We uh, plan to study decision-making under uncertainty anywhere from the brain all the way to markets. Um, we want to bring together um, economists who understand decision theory, game theory, when it uh, concerns risk of a social uh, dimension. Um, we want to bring in the neuroscientist, the biologist, the computational neuroscientist, the computer scientists who are related to the computational neuroscientist, um, the engineers, uh, the people who understand neurology, um, imaging, brain imaging, and even uh, people who work with animals, uh, because animals uh, do also make decisions under uncertainty. Most of your research is based on experiments. Now, in economics and finance, the use of experiments is still very rare. Why do you use experiments, and what is it that we can learn from experiments that we can't learn from more traditional research? We've come to the conclusion uh, that financial markets in particular, uh, or any financial interaction, is extremely complicated. Um, you cannot understand the principles of financial markets or any phenomenon if it's too complicated. Um, by just observing it, you uh, really want to take out bits and pieces and um, see what happens in a controlled setting where you control some of the confounding factors. Uh, I'll just give you an, an, uh, the analogy, an analogy that I usually give to my students. Uh, there is this um, very well-known principle in physics that objects fall um, at a speed that's not dependent on the weight. And uh, if you were to go with that principle to the real world, you would just think it's absolute baloney. And yet everybody knows it's true. And how do we know that it is true? Well, because of controlled experimentation. The fact that actually it hasn't much, it doesn't have much predictive power in the real world does not mean it is extremely useful because you start building on top of it. It's interesting actually to know that theory in finance and economics is way ahead. Um, is actually very stylized, very, you know, tries to eliminate confounding factors. So much of the theory that we have developed in the last 100 years applies much more to experimentation or lends itself to experimentation more than actually it is useful in uh, exp explaining the world outside the complicated financial markets as we know them. Why is it important to link finance and economics on the one side and neuroscience and biology on the other? Um, well, to understand that, um, uh, well, the obvious answer is, of course, we are biological organisms, right? Um, so um, when you see people make choices, you would suspect that the brain's got to do something with it. Um, uh, but there is more to it. So economics and finance started very much in the rational choice theory. Um, uh, how should you make decisions? Um, and then later on entered psychology, actually relatively early on already. Um, and psychology has helped us a lot, but mostly categorizing what was wrong with the rational theory. Where the biology comes in is answering the question, why? Um, humans, the human brain is shaped, and I should even emphasize, optimized for uncertainty over the years. But it's a particular type of uncertainty that we see in nature that people have uh, been um, exposed to. 
um, when we took over from Neanderthal, and these were during the Ice Ages, um, there was a lot of fluctuation, uh, a lot of uncertainty at that uh, point in time. And um, it's obvious from the tasks that you give people and how the brain reacts, uh, that the, the brain is optimized for, does an incredibly good job in incredibly complicated tasks. But there is a suspicion that actually uh, the tasks that, are humans, that humans are good um, at do not include financial tasks or dealing with financial markets. But the jury is out on there, and that this is what we're actually trying to research, right? And we also want to help people, give them tools to improve um, uh, things. After all, humans, the human brain is not made to fly in the sky, yet we are now flying uh, airplanes and so, and we have developed the right tools to make sure that we can stay uh, in the clouds without crashing. I'm going to make a bold statement here. Um, all the easy problems that could be solved within a discipline have been solved. The real big problems out there, um, uh, including how to deal with financial markets, uh, cannot be solved if you don't involve people from uh, other fields. In Melbourne, we're going to set up one of the first classes ever in a finance department uh, on algorithmic trading. And we will let the students um, develop their own robots, their own uh, algorithmic traders, and they can trade them in a controlled setting so they can actually realize what, what, uh, what, what is happening there. And that may be a curiosity for most of them. That may be for a computer scientist uh, uh, a good way to learn Python. Um, for a finance student, maybe a good way to learn about um, financial market microstructure, bid ask spread, the open book, etc. But at the end of the day, they will learn very valuable skills to go out in the real world if um, they're hired by a financial uh, company, an algorithmic trader, to actually do this in the real world. Uh, they will be they will have been exposed to this in a controlled setting. There are more than 700 neuroscientists clustered within a radius of 200 meters or so here in Parkville at the university and some affiliated research institutes, which makes this one of the largest clusters of neuroscientists in the world. What are the benefits of such a large number of researchers in the same field working together in, in one space or in a small space? Well, there are several advantages, the uh, equipment, the expertise, potential collaborations uh, that are there. But I think in the first place, what's extremely important to realize is that uh, you cannot do the types of things that we are doing if you don't have the right intellectual environment, if you don't have um, um, experts in many of the subfields that you can actually go to and talk to and, 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 and bounce ideas off most of uh, the research, all the, the big successes I've been involved in I cannot claim our mind. They're based on an interaction uh, with others. And yes, it's very well known that Melbourne is, is, is like that. Actually, uh, one uh, of my senior colleagues in uh, neurology uh, uh, two weeks ago, uh, when he uh, told me about, uh, oh, so you, you're going to Melbourne, um, he, he urged me, go. It's going to be wonderful.